Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mike Mello, editor of Providence Business News. I'm joined by Joe Devine, executive director of the Tech Collective. And we're pleased to present to you our sixth annual and first virtual cybersecurity summit. After last year's cybersecurity summit, we heard from many of you that you were looking for us to take a deeper dive into this all important topic, especially with the pandemic and more and more employees working remotely. So this year we've decided to partner with the Tech Collective to offer a three part summit. The first part will feature our keynote speaker, Tom Doyle, a cybersecurity analyst at the FBI's Boston field office. Following that, you'll be able to choose between three breakaway sessions. First is a leadership session, which will feature panelists who will assess a recent cyber incident to provide insights and best practices to mitigate, respond, and recover from a security incident. Next is a practitioner session entitled Ransomware, the next step in the kill chain, which will involve panelists discussing how increased granularity with users and domain environments can help control ransomware spread. And finally, a small business session will feature a presentation of Tech Collective's Road to Resilience Security Program. We'll wrap up the morning with closing remarks by Kim Casey Palangio, Assistant Vice President, Victim Services Program of the Cyber Crime Support Network. If you joined early, you may have already visited a few of our exhibitor booths. They'll remain open throughout the event. But if you do not want to miss anything, we'll have a break around 9.50 in which you can visit them as well. In a few minutes, Joe will give us more specifics about visiting the booths and more detail on each session so you can decide which one you should attend. But before that, I'd like to first acknowledge and thank our sponsors for their support. Returning as presenting sponsor is accounting, tax, and business advisory firm, Loom Shapiro. And returning as partner sponsors are Cox Business and Secure Future Tech Solutions. And now I'd like to turn it over to Joe Devine, Executive Director of the Tech Collective, to say a few words. Joe? Thanks, Mike. At the Tech Collective's Rhode Island's Technology Industry Association, and we are so pleased to partner with PBN for Rhode Island's signature cybersecurity event. Over the last couple of years, the Tech Collective has invested heavily in cybersecurity. Our steering committee develops programming for our three primary targets, technology leaders, technology professionals, and small business leaders without technology on their staff. After we've and we've taken the same approach today with our breakout sessions. After Tom Doyle from the FBI's Boston Regional Office presents our keynote, you can choose the breakout session that best meets your needs. But first, some housekeeping issues to cover. Some of you may be new to Crowdcast. This is a browser-based platform which works best in Chrome. If you look closely in the upper left corner, you will see the schedule. Clicking the more link will expand your schedule to show all nine sessions of our summit. The first four are our sponsor rooms, which will be open throughout the summit. We'll have breaks between our sessions. You can visit our sponsor rooms to learn more about their services. You can move from one session to another simply by clicking on the description in the upper right-hand schedule. If you scroll down, you can see all the sessions, including the three breakouts. You can use the chat box on the right to connect with other attendees throughout the summit. During all the sessions, we encourage questions. We'll have someone monitoring the ask a question section on the lower part of your screen. If you have a question, please type it in this area. Also, take a look at the questions that are already written. You can add your vote to help move a question up the list. The questions with the most votes are most likely to get asked during the session. Now on to our keynote. Mr. Tom Doyle is a cyber intelligence analyst with the FBI's Boston Field Office. For the past 10 years with the FBI, Tom has investigated criminal and counterintelligence computer intrusions throughout New England. His investigative work includes computer forensic analysis during the Boston Marathon bombing, identification of individuals behind financially motivated cyber crimes, and attribution for computer attacks on critical network infrastructure. Mr. Doyle is also a 20-year veteran of the U.S. Army Reserve, which has included tours of, tours of duty in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Japan as a military intelligence and cyber operations officer. Mr. Doyle is also an adjunct professor at Endicott College. He holds an MS in information assurance and a BS in computer science. Tom, thank you for your service and for joining us today. Thank you, Joe, for having me. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, 
I'm going to spend a few uh, moments today talking about uh, current cyber threats in the region, specific to the New England and Rhode Island region. One thing I want to start off with is first, putting an event like this is always difficult, um, and especially during a pandemic. So I do want to give my thanks to the Province Business News for, for hosting this event. Um, and thank you for joining me so I can share some information on current cyber threats that we see. And before I throw my slides up, I just want to mention that the title of the slides is the changing, evolving cybersecurity threat. And just what I'm doing here today is changing in the government, is, is actually an example of change in the government. Uh, if I did this a year ago, I would probably be fired or I'd have my security clearance revoked, um, but things are changing rapidly. Uh, the bad news is, is that cyber criminals are also adapting uh, as well. Uh, we've seen a 94% increase in cyber fraud activity to the FBI Boston office, and we've also seen a 250% increase in ransomware attacks in the region. So I'll talk more about that today, but I just want to um, acknowledge that before I, uh, I throw my slides up right now. So the first slide here might be one of the most important because it has my email address on the bottom. So feel free to write down the email address, contact me if you ever um, need to contact me for anything. However, there's other ways you can reach out to us as well instead of going directly to us. So a little bit about the FBI Boston office before I go into to, uh, threats that are out there right now. So I work on a cyber criminal squad, which means that I focus on hackers who are um, going after uh, computer systems for profit. However, we also have a national security cyber squad as well. The, the national security cyber squad is focused on foreign hackers trying to get, uh, get into computer systems all over the U.S., including here in New England. Here in New England, as you probably are aware, there's a lot of research and medical facilities here, in, especially in the Boston region and, and in province. And those computer networks are getting probed by individuals employed by foreign governments trying to hack into those systems. So we have an entire squad that helps mitigate the threats by those actors. And then this, um, and as was shown on the screen on the left-hand side, that's our FBI Boston office. That's our main office in Chelsea, Massachusetts. But we also have an office in Rhode Island in, on Waybossett Street. So um, we do have a nexus to Rhode Island. I personally have a nexus to Rhode Island. I was born and raised in East Providence. So definitely feel free to reach out. Uh, I'm more than happy to take a drive down uh, to my old stomping grounds um, at any point. So we have what's called an RA, the resident agency in Rhode Island. So that's our, our point of contact in Rhode Island. So we also have, you'll see on the screen down on the bottom is symbols uh, from different federal agencies. That's what we call a task force model. The cyber threat is too much for us to go after it by ourselves. So we have to employ assets from other federal agencies. So I sit with agents from cyber agents from the IRS, Department of Education, Department of Homeland Security, and even state and local um, um, uh, police officers who are assigned to our task force. So in case you have something that you don't know where to go to, at least contact us. We can probably point you in the right direction uh, on where your cyber incident should matter. If you had to take one um, picture of like your screen during this presentation, I would urge you to take this photo, this this screen as something you can take back with you. This is basically our way of reach of you reaching out to us. You'll see on the left on the bottom, you'll see severity of incidents, and then going from left to right. On the left-hand side, you'll see the Internet Crime Complaint Center. That is our way of taking intake almost passively from, from victims. So if you have an incident and you're not sure where it should go to, at least put it to ic3.gov. And you can point, even if you don't have a cyber incident and you just have a suspicious activity, you can go to ic3.gov, fill in that form, and then it gets sent to us and you can do that anonymously. By filling out that form, it's a, very similar to a police report where you'll get an I, ID number, you'll get um, feedback on your report, where it goes from there. If you So if you put anything, if you have, just have anything you wanna share with us, please put it at ic3.gov. And the reason why is that it helps us get what we call venue for legal process 
if we have a victim or an attempt, attempted victim in the Boston region, which is Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and uh, Maine, we can serve legal process um, a little easier by ha by showing that somebody filed a report with IC3.gov. The next, uh, in the middle, you'll see the cyber task force model. That's when you can reach out to us directly, um, one of our local field offices. For you in Rhode Island, it would be the FBI Boston office where you can see the phone number on the bottom. By, and by the way, if you ever get a phone call from someone claiming to be from the FBI, feel free to uh, hang up on the phone and call our main office line. And there's so many spoof phone calls nowadays and people claiming to be from the IRS or the FBI. Uh, feel free to hang up, Google the actual number of the FBI local office, and then um, we can connect you with uh, the appropriate agent. It's kind of instead of just uh, taking a phone call. This happens a lot nowadays. And then lastly, if there's something after hours, contact SciWatch. It's our 24 hours operation center. Um, for, for reporting a cyber incident. That will get you in contact with somebody. We have field offices across the US and across the world. So at some point, somebody, if it's severe enough, we can have somebody actually reach out um, on our side directly. Before I move on, I wanted to mention something. There's always this um, concern that if you share information with the FBI, it's it will get disclosed or, or they're gonna wanna take over uh, network resources, and I, I can't emphasize enough that's not really the case. We have enough data as it is now. Uh, we don't want your data, <laughs> quite honestly. Uh, we don't want to work, you know, be uh, looking at masses amount of data. What we want to look for is the bad guy indicators, the malicious IP addresses or domain names that we can work with. So if you want to reach out, if you if you have concerns about reaching out to us. Please just call us and say, hey, this website looks suspicious. What do you know about it? We're more than happy to take that and, and, and help you out. I can't emphasize enough that if you're a victim, we treat you like a victim, not like the criminal. So we actually go out and actually try to help and we work with you on how far you want us to help you out. I would say one last thing. Calling the FBI should not be your incident response plan but I hope that it is part of your incident response plan. Uh, we have a lot of good information from years and years of investigations. Case in point, let's start, let's go into like the, what the bad guys are doing. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of insight on what we're seeing on our end as far as the ransomware threat. Last year, several individuals received a message like this. And when I say individuals, that's organizations in the Boston region. Right around Christmas time, they'll come in on a Monday morning or, on a, or they'll get this over the weekend of, of a ransom threat. And you can see just from that, stop, that, that top line, it's very, very uh, timely. It's somebody who's not just pressing a button and sending it out. It's very, very customized to their victim as far as the timing and as far as how far into the victim they're getting information from. So this was an actual message that was um, left and this uh, victim, uh, their ransom amount was over a million dollars. And during Christmas time, it was very um, tempting just to pay that a million dollars and uh, to get their systems back in line. Luckily, they had uh, resources available to actually, they had a good, very robust backup system and they were able to restore um, their information over, over the uh, Christmas break. The next slide is probably going to be a little more enlightening as far as this threat. This slide is from the last year, from September to December, through December, of ransomware victims here in the FBI Boston region. Now, keep in mind, you'll see a lot of Massachusetts there and only a couple of Rhode Islands, looks like three Rhode Island. However, this is what's only reported to us. We estimate we're only getting about 25% of ransomware victims actually reaching out to us. So if you do the math with this list, you can get a good idea on how many victims are actually in the region. 
And there, this is December, so you can get a good idea on when they were deploying the ransomware. Two things that, uh, that we came from this, uh, that we, we derived from this data was that there was, um, actually, I'm not going to move yet. Most of these infections, especially with Christmas time, these were done during after hours. So about three quarters of ransomware infections that we're seeing, as far as what we know, is during after hours. So it really sets um, the importance of having a good incident response plan in place for those after hour infections. The other thing we saw, which I'm going to move to this year's data. This is this year's data. So this is through July of this year. I can tell you for sure that if I continued with August and September and now October, this font would even be smaller and probably wouldn't be legible at all, which is why I left that off. Um, we are continuing to see about two to three, probably two a day for ransomware evictions, uh, infections since September. And I think, I don't know if that has something to do with the schools, um, the timing, but uh, it's just a, an explosion of um, ransomware threats, especially during the pandemic, especially about a month into the pandemic, we started seeing uh, an increase in um, ransomware infections. So the number here, is not reflective on what we've seen. We're probably at over 100 right now, as far as what's reported to the FBI Boston office. And you'll see, I put unknown as, as one of the top variants. Um, and, and the reason I put that there, it's it's because we're not really getting a full um, a full picture on, on infections in our area. I would want to point out lately, over the past few weeks that uh, we had a ransomware infection yesterday, it was a um, construction company um, and before that, it was a um, HVAC company, and it's. But these are companies that make millions in revenue. It's not, they're not household names, but they make millions and millions in revenue. And and I think these ransomware vector, uh, these actors are now focusing more on these um, industries that don't make, that aren't in the financial world, which would have the resources to respond to these attacks. But these organizations that have. Um, a large amount of money, but probably not that back end um, protecting their infrastructure. Um, that's what we were kind of seeing, in, and it's too early really to tell, but that's been the shift lately. So what do we get from those raw numbers? It's very easy to just look at the statistics, but what's actually going, what's going on behind the scenes? That's a 250% increase in infections in our area. That's not nationwide that's in our area and what we're also seeing as, as a lot of you are probably familiar with they're not just getting onto the systems and infecting a few systems they are taking their time and going through all the servers all the network drives out there taking their time taking weeks to get on there and i want to stop there for a minute because that does give us a little bit of um, time because as they're trying to um, pivot across different systems in an organization, they're, they're communicating back with their, um, what we call command and control servers or their, their servers overseas. Um, as they're communicating back and forth, sometimes we can actually see infections because we have either people or we have sensors or we have access to their systems and we can see who they're targeting. Another good reason to re why to reach out to the FBI, because we do on occasion go out to companies and tell them, hey, these, these actors are on your systems. They haven't turned on the ransomware infection yet, but they're being prepared to, they're getting ready to. Code innovation on that third bullet, that's pretty, pretty important. Um, they're not just getting onto the systems that I mentioned encrypting files they're going onto the systems and capturing passwords they're capturing data they're running processes to keep that persistence on there and to uh, to do more damage later on it seems like they're starting to capture passwords and capture and capture data which i'll talk about leaking data in, in the next screen but it's uh it, once you actually break down that malware you can actually see the very very automated and very very robust systems um, that they have in place they also have a like a business model in place where they have one person is developing the ransomware 
And then they have what we call affiliates actually doing the intrusions and doing the negotiations on the, um, on the victims. That seems to be their business model. We'll call it ransomware as a service. I told, I mentioned um, the ransom amounts. The ransom amounts are continuing to increase. Uh, we had one victim here in this area pay over $2 million to get their systems back and up, up and running. And um, some of these industries, if they're not making money, um, they need to, they need their systems up and running. Um, and I'll talk about the concerns about paying a ransom in two more slides. And I already mentioned the outside of work hours. And lately, I think a lot of you are already familiar with this. Um, however, these actors now know that the double extortion is being successful. The double extortion is they encrypt your files, but they also grab your files and start to leak it. So a case, a little story. Um, we had an organization in, um, in the South and they were an educational organization and they initially didn't pay the ransom. So the actors uploaded um, all their files to a leak site on the dark web. And once that got out, some of those files included uh, payment, uh, income tax records, um, uh, salaries, um, paychecks, and some other internal data to that organization, including student records and student PII or student information. As a result of that, the community was pretty upset and you could start to see the new negotiation take place between the ransomware victim and the ransomware operator. And the operator knew they had the victim in a compromising spot by leaking that data. So there was no negotiation done by the operator. Even though this was an educational institution, which doesn't have a lot of money. So the ransomware operators, um, did not budge at all. And they, and the, the education area had to pay a certain amount of money to get their files back. Um, and it seemed like they weren't going to pay initially when the, the data was encrypted, they could just rebuild their systems. But once the data was starting to get leaked and they had to deal with the ramifications of that, that's when they decided to, to really, really open up the pocketbook and pay a, a very, very large ransom um, for them to stop leaking files and for them to get their data back. Hey, Alan, just a quick interruption with a couple of questions that are right around this section. Um, I know you said you're going to talk about whether you recommend paying the ransom, but um, Alan uh, from the chat mentions there's a statistic available that 80% of ransom paid has been recovered. And first, I wonder if that might be true. And then if that is true, is that the main driver why companies do pay the ransom? Oh, so the 80% is if they pay the ransom, they'll get their data back. Data back, not their money back. Yeah, yeah, data back. Yes. Um, from what I've seen, you know, these guys are running it like a business. So I, t I talked about the negotiation um, part. Um, that's more mob like, <laughs> but as far as the actual being true to their word and getting their data back, um, we have seen um, that's pr that seems about accurate from as far as the cases that we work on. Um, if they pay the money, they'll probably get their data back. It'll probably get un unencrypted because they want to continue to um, make future victims and, 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 and pay the ransom. There are a few, and that's actually a good segue um, to this next slide. There are a few variants where they don't get their, pay their, their data back. It's like a, their, the decryption file, the decryption key is, uh, is corrupted and the data will be corrupted. And, and we know this because we have a very, very targeted approach on ransomware investigations. Um, as it says on the screen right now, we have 50, this is actually old, now we have more, um, 53, at least 53 investigations open on different ransomware variant types. And what that means is that a particular field office will become the expert on a certain ransomware variant. Boston has one. Um, so we know, we know the ransom negotiation um, process. 
we know the likelihood of getting your files back if, if it's decrypted. We, we might even know if there's a decryption key available. So the, another good reason why to reach out um, if there, to, to the FBI if there is a ransomware infection. We're not gonna be able to help most likely with the process of getting your money, of your uh, the files back, but we can give you some insight on who's operating um, these ransomware variants. And the other thing we're doing, and it takes years, um, it takes years to figure this out. So definitely reach out to us. We definitely have good ideas on, on different um, the different variants out there. And it takes years, but we do make headway in either taking sites down or making arrests. So what I show on the screen on the right-hand side there is a website called XDDIC, which was selling um, remote access credentials such as RDP or remote desktop protocol um, logins and other usernames and passwords on there. And we weren't, were able to go after the actual people running the site. We identified them. We have their names on wanted posters, um, but they're out of the reach of law enforcement and in, in either Russia or former Russian um, uh, Russian countries. And but what we can do is take down the infrastructure, which is why I show Director Ray, the FBI Director Ray, on the screen as well. Um, he's really made it a point, even th during this pandemic, to actually take down the infrastructure of, of these ransomware operators. We're probably not going to be able to go after a lot of the actual operators, but we can go after the, the people operating the websites the dark websites either or the open web websites or the people um, assisting with infrastructure. For instance, you'll see under arrest there in Washington state in Florida for a variant called Repiton. The operators of that ransomware variant were overseas, but there were people here facilitating payment. So we were able to identify them in a, and arrest them. They weren't just facilitating payment to the people overseas, they're also providing the infrastructure um, to, uh, to basically get money from victims. But now, um, I mentioned a lot there with um, overseas. These, these actors are operating in countries that we can't, um, unfortunately, go there and, and arrest them. We can do a, a couple things. Um, we can, I, I mentioned the wanted poster, we can name and shame them when we, we publicize them. But we can also um, put notices out if they travel. And if they travel, we can, um, to a country that's cooperative with the US, we can talk to them there. I'll say talk to them, <laughs> we'll go, I'll leave it at that. Um, but the other problem with these countries is that if you these countries are now profiting pretty strongly off um, different ransomware variants. You might have heard of the WannaCry ransomware from I think it was 2017, uh, which we which the government attributed to North Korea. Um, in a way, they were North Korea was profiting off victims worldwide. So since that time, this just came out two weeks ago. Um, it looks like you know, three weeks ago. The Department of Treasury put out this notice or this advisory aimed at companies that pay ransomware um, payments, like an insurance company, a cyber insurance company, or a incident response firm. Those organizations have paid um, ransomware payments and they've gone to um, actors overseas and without telling the government. And here's the problem with that, is that we'll identify someone overseas, say Iran, and we'll see payments from US organizations to this Iranian actor, um, you know, a country that's sanctioned. And we don't know why, and we have to kind of take time to actually backtrack and realize it was because of a ransomware payment. So the Tower and Treasury put this notice out, like, if, if you're paying a ransomware variant, you might be violating, um, and when I say you, I, 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 this was aimed towards companies, like cyber insurance companies and incident response companies. This isn't victims. It says on behalf of victims, you might be violating OFAC regulations. 
However, if you actually read the full advisory, it kind of mentions anyone who gives money to sanctioned companies could be um, in trouble. However, if you notify law enforcement, that has a very, very big note, uh, mitigation factor um, as far as um, paying those ransomware payments. Please, whatever you take from this presentation on this slide here, I am not a lawyer and I'm not providing legal advice. I am just making you aware that this notice just came out uh, a few weeks ago. So, and it's something to consider in your incident response plans. And I, uh, I also have, um, if any of your organizations collect information or uh, and there's a little more advisory in that, that second advisory is more little advice. If you, um, if any organizations here actually go out and go on to hacker forums to, to get data, um, there's some good uh, legal advice there. But please consult your legal department. I can't stress that enough. I should have put that on the slides. <laughs> please consult your legal department. All right, as I uh, get into the last few minutes here, I, I did want to, um, I mentioned at the start, there was a 94% increase in um, cyber fraud activity since the pandemic happened. And, and, and I mentioned IC3 earlier on too. So the other good thing about IC3 for me, for us, is that it helps us keep a pulse on what's going on in the region. And you can see from these statistics, it really told us that the heart rate or the cybercrime activity in early 2020 was pretty high. Um, we basically doubled the amount of um, complaints received at IC3, and not just in Rhode Island, but across the region, across the US. And this was all because everyone was turning online for, and it was everything minor. There was minor incidents like Zoom bombing that gets filed to IC3. There was um, employment scams that was being um, filed to IC3. So it's because everything was getting um, remote. Since that time, it's still been a little higher than normal, probably about a third higher than normal. And, and I want to emphasize that because as all your workers are going remote online, there seems to be more targeting. Um, there seems to be more issues because they're maybe because they're working from home or, or, or whatnot. I don't know, but there it definitely has been an increase in um, different, um, different, uh, different fraud or, or threat activity. Well, one thing that we also saw was uh, people selling um, COVID related equipment too. That also was, was a big reason for that to fraudulently selling COVID related equipment online. Um, so that was, that was another mitigating factor. So who's doing all this fraud? So uh, most of the time the fraud comes from different co um, countries where they don't have the processes in place. So I got about five minutes here. So I'm gonna um, go through this quickly and really emphasize one part of this, um, one part of that, this threat about fraud and, and online activity is that these individuals are really, really making a profit and taking time which you would think is not worth it. But in these over in these countries where getting a little bit of amount of money is a lot of money to them. So we've seen in countries like Nigeria um, and, and other countries in Africa, uh, these individuals are very, you know, it's no longer that Nigerian princess scam. It's definitely getting sophisticated where they're using um, remote access Trojans and all these other cyber hacking tools now. And the other thing that they're doing is is gathering intelligence, which is for me as a military intelligence officer, it's really, really, it's fascinating to see, uh, you know, how much intelligence that you can gather on potential victims online. So the reason why I wanted to show a couple of uh, the products that they were using, um, I know a lot of businesses on here probably use, and I don't want to name names of uh, US business, um, tools and marketing tools but these guys are using it these bad people are using those tools as well they're getting um, premium subscriptions to anything uh whether it's linkedin premium or um any type of service they're using stolen credit cards they're getting access for 30 days for the trial period and then they'll move on to another credit card get a trial period and they're building up this intelligence 
um, on U.S. businesses and people that is is, is quite impressive. I, I list Lead 411, which would tell you when new CFOs or accountants are working at different organizations. Um, Lead 401 grabs that information when there's announcements or press releases about um, people um, starting at a new company in a financial role. These guys were getting those notifications. Hey, this is a new CFO. This is a new COO at this company. Maybe that's someone that we can target. There's also these um, bulk email lists that are available where you'll see on the screen with the flag, the US controller email list. You can buy that off the internet for $250 and you get access to 25,000 emails of uh, US controllers. Is it all valid? Probably not, but they have it and they're using it. And then they use online tools like Turbo Mailer and they're sending out, um, and this is probably gonna be one of my last slides, is, um, is a tool like this where they, they'll send, they'll use that information and they'll send it out to new employees or, uh, or anyone these uh what we call a phishing kit where they send out these fake login pages which look real and if i know some people here are probably saying oh i can see that in the url i can guarantee you that i've seen the inbox of some of these um actors using it and they are getting tens of thousands of um login credentials that these people are thinking they're logging into their Gmail or their Outlook, and they're actually sending it to a um, an operator overseas. And these kits are so sophisticated, after they click that sign-in button, it will actually redirect them to their actual inbox. And this is very, very um, sophisticated tools that these actors are using overseas. I just want to see. Um, we are trying to identify some of these individuals. Um, luckily, these guys sometimes use their real names. And in this case here, he, uh, this actor actually used that same email account um, and put his, uh, his report card in there. He was a decent student, by the way. Um, but because he put his report card in there and he sends his photo, um, we're able to ident identify these guys and um, indict them. But again, they're overseas. And some of these guys that we've indicted have done this again and again. So, and we'll try to go over there and we do make arrests. Um, this operation last fall, we arrested 167 individuals in Nigeria, but it's a constant pipeline that is going out, out there. There are a hundred, and the reason I put this slide up is because there's a hundreds of people doing this. It, you know, it's a whole operation. It's, it's, um, and it really comes down to user awareness and, in tools like multi-factor authentication implementing, implementing, <laughs> implementing those controls um, is really, really um, is key to, to stopping this type of stuff. So last slide, I did wanna leave you with one last thing. I kind of lied when I said, if you take one picture, um, I have one, uh, one more picture. Um, if you can take a picture of this slide as well, uh, it's, it's our resources. If you want to get information that we're getting from FBI investigations, we push them out through these what we call flash messages. And we our distro list, we don't send it out to the public for various reasons, but we do have a mailing list that we maintain at infraguard.org. If you're interested in getting um, you know, uh, indicators of compromise or just a story on what is going on in, in our investigations, um, we're doing this more and more often. Um, even if I didn't work for the FBI, I, I would I would push this. And lastly, um, DHS's CISA page at uscert.gov. Um, they are getting a, CISA is more on the protection side, where we're more on the investigative side. Um, CISA is part of DHS, Network Homeland Security, and they're more on the protective side. So they have a ton of resources and how to protect your systems for free, including risk assessments including guides like this, this ransomware guide that's on the screen, all for free. So if there's a small business out there that is just looking for some resources, um, your tax dollars are going um, to these resources. That's all I have for today. Um, thank you guys for joining me. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Yeah, Tom, we have uh, a lot of questions to go through. Um, first, these two are kind of related. And it was we really want to, so do you ever recommend paying the ransom is the first part of the question. But the second part is if the company does pay the ransom, 
do they, you had said about 80% of the time they get the data back, but presumably the bad actors have already leaked the data to the dark web. Can you kind of comment on that as well? Yeah, the devil's in the details on that one. Um, for the uh, for the actual, like, um, has the data already been um, leaked? It depends on the um, ransomware variant. Um, they might have, act some, some of these actors just want to encrypt files and they're not going to leak the data. Um, but it depends on the um, the ransomware variant. Um, so in some cases, it's if you pay the ransom, they're not um, they don't care about the data. Um, they don't care about leaking it. They just want their money. So in some cases, they're not um, they're not actually collecting the data. As far as the advice of paying the ransom, it, it's a bad it, it's a bad thing for us to say. Um, I, I don't like saying it, but we we kind of say it's a business decision because we can't we our, our official position is not to pay the ransom because you're paying a criminal um however we know the reality is that it, it really comes down to are you going to get your data back and for us our investigations take years uh, unfortunately to actually get to the identity and actually get um money back uh, especially in, in the cryptocurrency world maybe never getting that money back so unfortunately, um, we, we do say it not to pay the ransom for various reasons, but it also comes down to a business decision that we can't um, really give advice to. Of course, that, thanks. Um, so another question, um, I understand a lot of these ransomware folks are difficult to prosecute because they are out of country, et cetera. Uh, couldn't counterattacks be done against them to shut down their technology? So yes, so let me go back to uh, this slide just because I that I kind of hinted at that without actually um, talking about that. So um, Director Ray there is pictured at, at Boston College just a week before the pandemic happened. Um, so he uh, he has made it clear in um, and I had a link there and I took it away. But if anyone wants to Google this, it's um, it's the Director Ray's CISA speech. He just gave a speech last week where he actually indicated, without clearly saying, um, we're going to do some of that operations. I would say that, yes, there is a now, because of the severity of ransomware threats in, in the region, there is there is definitely a, uh, a process that is starting that we're going to work with some of our um, federal partners who have the authority to go after um, ransomware operators overseas. Uh, because this is a recorded uh, <laughs> presentation, that's probably as far as I can go. Um, it's and but one last thing is that it, this is slow, but it is going to happen eventually. Um, it's just um, the government is probably just taking its time and being careful about um, those actions. Kind of tied into that overseas question is a question about. Um, are these actors nation state sponsored or organized crime? This doesn't seem like uh, script kiddies from what you have presented. Yeah, so it's it's more organized crime because uh, but they're operating in countries that are basically providing them a safe haven. Most of this is from Russia, um, almost a large percentage. I don't want to give numbers out. However, as you I mentioned, um, a wanna cry, which was we attributed it to North Korea, and then Iran. Um, actors were using something called sam sam so it, but these were actors probably on the cyber criminal side acting overseas i would say predominantly it, it is more of the cyber criminal threat um but the uh, the point i want to make with this is that the actors that did a lot of national security um hacking 10 years ago they're they're leaving those um those government positions overseas they're no longer a chinese state-sponsored hacker and they're going more into the um on their own hacking so they can make money um, that's where we're, we're, we've seen a big trend on so it's it's on the line a lot of times thanks uh, another question uh asking if the fbi can help recover funds that have been stolen through a wire transfer yes uh yes we can um and that's something i just didn't have time to, to hit but if you that that IC3 all the way on the left hand side, they have a form there where if you uh, transfer money, um, you click on a button that says either wire transfer or business email compromise, and it will go the the form that's on IC3 
will pop will auto populate to a a form for wire fraud will ask specific questions um related to wire fraud and then it gets sent to our um what we call we call it the financial fraud kill chain uh where it goes into this process of contacting banks um to freeze funds so we have points of contact um at, at a lot of banks where we know the person to reach out to to freeze funds and sometimes it's it's best for organizations to reach out to us so they're not contacting the bank directly we're saying with the fbi you need to freeze these funds um and then once they're frozen um we can um start the process of, of getting the money back if you contact us within 72 hours that's the window unfortunately after 72 hours is very very difficult to uh, freeze funds all right well thank you so much tom um first of all awesome job today breaking down what's actually happening in the space it's it's sobering to think about these bad actors optimizing their attacks and their processes to grow their businesses for long term at our expense but um we really appreciate you taking your time to share your knowledge and expertise and your expertise with us today thanks so much Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, before we take our break and visit the sponsor rooms, I want to help you pick the right breakout session. So um, we have three sessions after our break. We've got about a 10 minute break. We're going to be getting together back at 10 o'clock. We would invite you to join in one of the rooms. If you remember up in the uh, upper left hand corner, you can drop that schedule down. And by clicking on any of those breakout uh, sessions, you can pick the one you want. Also, um, if um, before that, please visit those sponsor rooms um, that we have available to uh, kind of hear about uh, the companies and what they're doing cool that are uh, sponsoring our sessions today. But on this breakout sessions, the uh, leadership session is going to be more strategic uh, with a strong risk management deep dive look at the ongoing Blackboard uh, ransomware attack. We have some great panelists there you'll hear from. Um, the professional session is more of a technical look at the next steps in the ransomware kill chain. And uh, we've got some uh, techies that are going to lead you through uh, getting more granular with your users and your domains. Uh, and finally, if you're a small business and you're looking to prove your security resilience, you should check out the Small Business uh, Road to Resilience program from the Tech Collective. Uh, we've been running that program for over a year now. Uh, Cox Business has been a sponsor of that. And uh, Secure Future Tech is going to walk you through um, how do I take a look at your systems with security professionals and with some open source free tools that we can help you install to improve your uh, resilience? And this this uh, program is available all the time uh, through the Tech Collective. Uh, we're just going to feature it here today. So the last thing I want to mention is that all these breakouts will be recorded and available uh, afterwards. So don't worry if you pick one, you'll be able to see the others later. Um, and finally, while we have this break, uh, please check out the sponsor rooms um, and then pick your breakout session and we'll see you back at 10 a.m. Thanks. <laughs>